The scripture this reading this morning is from the book of John, chapter 4, verses 13 through 30. The book of John, chapter 4, verses 13 through 30. If you're using the Pew Bible, the verses can be found on pages 73 and 74 in the New Testament. The Pew Bible's in front of you. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst, ever. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come back here to draw. He said to her, Go, call your husband and come back here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband. For you had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people... The Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. At this point, his disciples came and they were marveling that he was speaking to a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek, or why are you speaking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. Is this not the Christ? They went out of the city and were coming to him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. We uh, come again to John chapter 4 and uh, see the glorious truths that Jesus declares to us in this chapter. And today we come specifically to look at what Jesus has to teach us about worship. And um, as we get started, would you please pray uh, with me and ask for the Lord to bless us as we come and sit under his word. Father, we thank you that you are a God of salvation. You are our creator, but you are also, through Jesus Christ, our perfect and all-sufficient redeemer. You are our powerful redeemer. Lord, some of us, most of us in this room, know exactly what is being declared in that song we just sang. Hear him ye deaf, his praise ye dumb, your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold your Savior come, and leap, ye lame for joy. Lord, so many of us here have tasted the goodness of your salvation. And we know what it is to be deaf and to have our ears open to hearing the truths of the gospel. Lord, we know what it is to be blind and to have our eyes um, opened to seeing the glory of God in the face of Christ. We, we know what it is to be lame and unable to, to move and to walk and to run, to do anything in this life for your sake or for our good, and, and then to be restored through that healing message of the gospel, that balm of Gilead that you've provided for us and your beloved son. 
Father, I, I pray that as we come to this portion of your word, that these truths relating to worship, true worship, that Jesus, your son, has taught us. Father, I pray that it would cause our open ears to hear all the more clearly and our seeing eyes to behold more gloriously the truths of Jesus, or that we would um, uh, leap higher with a greater sense of joy in seeing what you've done for us in Jesus. God, let us not be content with empty rituals and external forms of religion. Lord, even those who truly uh, claim your name in faith can fall prey to uh, empty formalism. And maybe some of us here are, are guilty of that even this morning. Lord, I pray that you would forgive us as we confess that sin to you. You are worthy of more worship than that. So help us come before you with joy, Lord, with, with a true sense of thankfulness and, and lips of praise that give thanks to your holy name. Lord, that's the offering we want to bring today. Would you please equip us and fill us by your spirit so that we can do that well. We pray that you'd be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, as the title suggests, today we are talking about worship and uh, talking about true worship. What does it mean to truly worship God in a manner that is worthy of his name and acceptable to him? Well, as we begin to discuss that from what Jesus teaches us here in John 4, let me start with a couple of statements about worship that I think we need to make sure we're on the same page in regard to these things before we can move forward this morning. Number one, what is worship? Very often, worship can be described or even just understood as emotionalism, excitement, um, enthusiasm, and all of that is part of what accompanies our hearts whenever we do truly enter into worship uh, of God and the power of the Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ. We, we are enthusiastic whenever we're worshiping Him. We are exuberant in our joy. We, we have real excitement about Jesus whenever we are worshiping the Lord, and that's what makes worship so uh, engaging, so, so uh, dynamic even. But that's not... At the essence, that's not all that worship is, and that's not even definitional of what worship is. I think the old English word for worship got it right whenever it defined, or whenever it called what we call worship, it used the word worth-ship. Worth-ship. So, worship is ascribing praise and honor and worth to an object that you esteem. It's a demonstration. Real worship, in other words, is a demonstration of the worth of something through your devotion to that object. You are demonstrating its value. You are demonstrating its majesty. You are demonstrating its glory and its worthiness in the way that you serve and live your life before whatever that object might be. So to worship God is to live our lives in such a way that we demonstrate his worth through the means of our devotion to him. Okay, are we on the same page there? Worshiping God is demonstrating the worth of God through our lives. Number two, the substance of everything that the Bible demands of us can be summed up with that one word, worship, or with the command to worship God. So what is worship? Worship is ascribing and praising and honoring and demonstrating the the, the worth of God back to him with our lives, And this can be uh, summed up as the demand, the command of the scriptures that are upon us. The demand of the law, Deuteronomy 6.13, was you shall fear only the Lord your God and you shall worship him and swear by his name. That's not a suggestion, that's a command. You will worship him. That's what God was after in the hearts of the Israelites. And it's the same thing with every sinner on the face of the earth. Revelation 14, verse 7, it declares that this eternal gospel, this angel goes abroad throughout all the earth declaring an eternal gospel to the sons of men, calling all men to repent and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Part of that that summation of calling, that eternal gospel that that angel proclaimed is the command to worship God as the one who made heaven and earth. 
And so worshiping God is the sum and total of the entire Christian life. What we are seeking to do as we live as Christians is we are seeking to live lives that worship God. Number three, worship is not just something we are commanded to do. Worship is something that everyone does all the time. Romans chapter 1 verse 25 makes it clear that we all worship something. We either serve and worship the creature or we serve and worship the creator. But either way, every single one of us in this room is engaged in some form of worship towards some object. I remember sitting down with a guy on a cruise ship. I think I shared this maybe a couple weeks ago. I can't remember if it was in the pulpit or Sunday school class, but... Jamie and I were on a cruise. Is that ringing any bell with anybody? Yeah. Sat down with the guy, talked about worship. He's like, I don't worship anything. I said, no, you just don't understand. You don't see that everything you do in your life is an act of worship to yourself rather than to God. You're worshiping the creature. You're not worshiping the creator. Romans 1.25 tells us that we are all worshiping something. It's actually part of our nature as human beings. It's part of the way that God made us as his image bearer. So to be an image bearer of God means that we were created with this capacity and this yearning to worship. That worship, that, that act of worship was to be fulfilled and realized and devoted to the God whose image we bear. But part of our fall and part of our sinful living, our lifestyle of rebellion against God means that we take what we were meant and designed to give unto God and we give it to lesser things. Right? So the question, and whenever we're talking about worship, is not, do you worship? The question is, what do you worship? And that's what we're driving after as we walk through this passage on worship in John 4. Number four, fourth thing, last thing, at least as far as introduction is concerned. There's a lot more. Number four, every sin problem is actually a worship problem. Every sin problem is a worship problem. See, whenever you sin against the Lord, whenever you do not keep his commandments, when you don't hold fast to the Lord Jesus Christ with true and sincere faith, and you don't seek to live a life of pure and simple devotion to him, when you are sinning against the Lord, what you are doing is exalting the worth of something else above and beyond God. When we sin against the Lord and we live our lives contrary to his will, what we are saying in that action is that something else is worth more than God. In that moment, we are either saying that our own will, our own desire and pleasure is worth more than God's, or we are saying that some person or some thing is of greater worth and value to us than is pleasing and loving and serving and worshiping our God. But whatever it may be, when we devote ourselves to doing something that is sinful and contrary to the revealed will of God and his word, the heart of our problem is a lack of worshiping God. And what that means is the solution to that problem cannot be a bunch of rules and regulations. If, if behind every sin problem is a worship problem, then the problem of our worship has to be fixed in order for our sin problem to be fixed. You see that? So when you are not worshiping the Lord the way you ought to, the way that the word of God commands you to, the answer to that issue is not to say, okay, let me draw out this list of things that I think I ought to do and this, this checklist and these marks of things that I think will make me live a life that's pleasing to God. That's not where you start. That may be involved in the process further down the road, but that's not where you begin. Where you begin is addressing the heart issue, the core issue of where are my eyes looking that's causing me to sin against the Lord? Where is my heart being devoted to something else other than God? That's where you begin. You deal with the root issue, right? We're not modern medical doctors that just seek to treat symptoms. We're trying to get down to the heart of the problem and find out what's really going on. I don't mean to incriminate every single doctor with that statement, okay? And just we live in a day of qualifications. I've got to qualify everything I say. But you understand what I'm saying? We are trying to get to the root cause of the issue of our problem in worship. And if we don't begin by dealing with the heart of the matter, then we will not get anywhere in truly worshiping the Lord. So, and whatever we're doing, our sin is a, lack, is a worship problem, not merely a, a sin problem. 
Now, that's what this woman's in, uh, this uh, Samaritan woman's problem was. Her ultimate issue, of the, the, the ultimate problem in her life, was not the issue that she had five failed marriages. The ultimate problem in her life was not her broken relationships in her community that caused her to want to avoid all the women and the men of the city. Right? We saw that. She's going out to the well alone. She's going out in the middle of the day, clearly seeking to avoid uh, interaction with people in the city. That wasn't ultimately her problem, those broken relationships. Even her current adulterous relationship with this man with whom she was living, who was not her husband, even that's not ultimately her problem. Those were just fruits that were revealing the fact that despite her religion, she still did not know what it meant to taste the satisfying waters of, a, of living a life of holy worship to God. Do you get that? All those things, all those external matters in her life, the root issue there was that she had not yet come to understand how satisfying it is to live a life of communion and fellowship and holy worship to God. So behind every sin problem you've ever had or will have is the problem of deficient worship of God. Therefore, your greatest need and my greatest need and this woman's greatest need is to know the life-giving effect of living a spirit-empowered life of holy worship before God. That's what we need. We don't need greater plans and rituals. We don't need, uh, we don't need more uh, stern um, punishments for, for failing to live up to some stated goal. What we need is to get a greater vision of God in Jesus Christ that drives us to praise and worship him. A, a greater glimpse of his glory that causes us to recognize how truly great and magnificent he is. That will drive us into living a life of consecrated worship unto him. Not the other way around. So therefore, your greatest need in life is to live a life of spirit-empowered, holy worship before God. That's what's going to kill your sin. A joy and a delight and a love for God that drives you to offer your whole life in all its aspects up to God as a sacrifice of worship. That's, that's what this woman's problem was, and that is our ultimate problem, and that is actually what Jesus is addressing here in John chapter 4, verses 21 to 26. So this passage, as we enter into it, that's over with the introduction, this passage contains one of the most important teachings on the nature of true worship found anywhere in the Bible. So we want to look at it carefully so that we will understand how we can offer to God true, sincere, and acceptable worship through our Lord Jesus Christ. Is that your concern? Is your concern to offer a, a life of true and acceptable worship unto, the Lord through our, unto God through our Lord Jesus Christ? If so, then we need to pay attention to what Jesus has to say here about what true worship is. Number one, notice first that Jesus tells this woman that true worship is not about external forms and religious traditions. Remember what we saw a couple of weeks ago in John chapter 4, verses 19 through 20. What is this woman doing as Jesus has just exposed her life? He has just laid her open. And she knows that he knows the, the ins and outs of her life, and she feels shame over that. How does she respond? What was that word we used a couple weeks ago? Do you remember? You don't count. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. No. Deflecting, right? She's deflecting. She's trying to divert attention away from her personal life and kick Jesus out of that arena of her life where she doesn't want him. She doesn't want him digging up the personal things that are really going on, those skeletons in the closet, those hidden sins that no one else knows about, or the ones that everyone else does know about, but she's trying to avoid. She doesn't want to deal with Jesus on that level. She's trying to kick Jesus out into a realm where she's comfortable in discussing matters with him. And that's in the realm of this religious debate, right? Let's talk about theology. Let's talk about doctrine. Let's talk about religion. Let's not talk about my personal life. She's deflecting. In verses uh, 19 through 20, she kicks Jesus out of her personal life and gets to a conversation, gets the conversation back into a realm of religious debate where she was comfortable. She says, well, sir, since you are obviously a prophet, you can see into my life, you know exactly what's going on. Since you are a prophet, let me ask you this question. 
Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you people, the Jews, you say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Now, ought is a weak translation here. It should be translated must. You people say that in Jerusalem you must worship. Now, there's an implied question there, right? Which one is the right way? Which mountain do we worship on? Now, this woman is referring to a debate between the Jews and the Samaritans that had been raging in full swing for over 400 years at this point. The Jewish people said that all true worship of God had to take place in Jerusalem because that's what God himself had said in his word, right? Deuteronomy 12, verse 5, the Lord said that once he brought his people into the promised land, he would choose one place among them to make his name dwell. And verses 6 and 7 go on to make clear that all of their worship, all the worship of the Israelites, was to be offered to God at this one place where his name would dwell. Well, after the people of Israel come into the promised land, and after David has risen up as king, the Lord finally reveals where he's going to make his name dwell among his people, and that is in Jerusalem. You find this in 2 Chronicles 3, verse 1, where we find that God had chosen for his name to dwell among his people at Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. Those of you who know Genesis well enough, you know that something else happened on the mountains of Moriah. In Genesis 22, uh, Abraham and Isaac, something happened with them. That's where the Lord called uh, Abraham to offer up his son to God on the, in the mountains of Moriah. Well, here at Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, that's where God decided to cause his name to dwell among his people. First Kings 9, verse 3, the, the Lord told Solomon after the temple had been built, I've set apart this holy house which you have built by, by putting my name there forever. So according to God's word, the Lord had revealed that in Jerusalem he was to be worshipped. Now the Samaritans didn't agree with that. Does anyone know why? No, it's because they didn't accept any of the books that told us that Jerusalem was the place that God had chosen to make his name dwell. For the Samaritans, they only accepted the first five books of the Bible to be authoritative. They only accepted the the books of Moses to be the books that God had revealed to us to make known his will. And within the books of Moses, you don't find anywhere where Jerusalem is specified as the place where God is to be worshipped. However, you do find another mountain where worship is happening and where God's blessings are being declared over his people. And that just so happens to be Mount Gerizim. Right, this very mountain that this woman is pointing to, right, out, right outside of Sychar, when she says to Jesus, are we supposed to worship on this mountain right here, Gerizim, or are we to worship in Jerusalem? Which one? In Genesis 32, verse 20, this is where Jacob had worshipped the Lord by setting up an altar and calling it El, Elohe Israel. The God, the God of Israel. Jacob establishes that altar upon Mount Gerizim as he calls upon the God of Israel and worships him. And then in Deuteronomy 27, verse 12, it was on Mount Gerizim where the blessings of Yahweh were to be heralded over his people once they had come into the promised land. And so for the Samaritans who rejected any revelation from God post those first five books of the Bible, after Moses, they didn't receive any of the prophets, any of the other writings, they simply received the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. According to their reading of that law, it would seem to them that Mount Gerizim is the place where God should be worshipped. That's where Jacob worshipped. That's where the altar that's called God, the God of Israel is. That's where all the blessings of God were declared over the people. It would make sense that that's where God's to be worshipped if you're limited to the five books of Moses. So this Samaritan woman uh, who believed that Mount Gerizim was the right place to worship brings this up to Jesus as a means of deflecting the conversation away from her personal life. Now, watch what Jesus does in response to her beginning in John 4, 21. You guys still with me? Did I, did I lull you to sleep with the details yet? I hope not. Watch what Jesus does in John 4, 21. Number one, Jesus shifts her focus away from our fathers and you people to himself. She was asking about our fathers. Our fathers say we're to worship on this mountain. She was asking about you people. You people say we're to worship in Jerusalem. Jesus looks at her and says, it's not about the fathers. And it's not about the Jews in Jerusalem. It's about me. 
He shifts her focus away from the fathers and you people, and he says, believe me when I tell you the hour is coming. He shifts her perspective away from her ancestors and what they had taught her and away from the Jewish people and what they were saying, and he redefines in her mind the standard of truth by which she is to judge this debate. What is that standard? It's Jesus Christ. It's an amazing shift of perspective that Jesus offers here where he makes known to her that the ultimate authority on any matter, especially this matter of worship, is not what this person says or what that person says. It's what Jesus says. Jesus says, I am the authority here, woman. Believe me in what I tell you. Secondly, Jesus redirects her attention away from the fathers to the father. The fathers, plural, may have passed down many religious thoughts and traditions for how God was to be worshipped, but what ultimately mattered was not what they thought or what they came up with. What ultimately mattered was what the Father says about himself and how he is to be worshipped. Amen? This is ultimately what determines proper worship. Not what everyone else is saying or what any other church is doing, but what God wants us to, to do in our worship. Many of you may know this, may know this uh, phrase. I'll just throw it out there for your consideration, but it's, this is known as the regulative principle of worship. That the principle that we use to govern and guide our worship in the church must be regulated by God's revealed will. And not anything else introduced into that. So our worship of God must be regulated not by our traditions or by doing what has always been done or by our own thinking or by our own perspective on what ought to be done, but by God's will and what he's revealed to us in his word. I don't have time to unpack that anymore, but that's a really important concept. And Jesus sets that forth before this woman here in John 4, 21. It's not about the fathers. It's about the father and what he expects. Then notice thirdly, Jesus makes this woman's question Utterly irrelevant. When he says that the hour is coming when that issue will no longer matter. He says, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Now in this statement, Jesus declares the end of these old categories of thinking about how God was to be worshipped. He declares the end of any thinking that Mount Gerizim is where God is going to be worshipped in the future. It's not about Gerizim. But he also ends the category of thinking that says that it's really about Jerusalem and worshipping in the temple. He says the hour is coming when neither one of those are going to matter. Now that doesn't mean that Jesus says this issue is unimportant. You see that in verse 22. In fact, Jesus makes very clear that that this very issue determined whether or not a person truly worshipped God. He says very bluntly and very straightforwardly to this woman that what you have inherited from your fathers is ignorant worship. You worship what you do not know. The Greek word here is the same word from which we get the word ignorant, uh, uh, ignorant. Whenever you call someone an ignoramus, it comes from this word here. Jesus is telling this woman, you're ignorant. You're ignorant of how God's to be worshipped. Now, how would you like Jesus to say that to you? I know a lot of people that would be greatly offended by that. Jesus says, you don't know what you worship. In other words, this mountain, Gerizim, is not the place where God is to be worshipped. Then he says, concerning the Jews, we worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. So clearly, Jesus is taking a side in this debate, which means he doesn't see the issue as unimportant. But there's an hour coming when this issue will be irrelevant. We've already seen in John chapter 2 that just because people were worshiping in Jerusalem, in the temple, that did not necessarily mean that they were truly worshiping God, right? What did Jesus do when he came into Jerusalem in John chapter 2? He cleared the temple. Why did he have to clear the temple? Because the worship that was being offered there was not true worship. The hour was coming, and Jesus says in verse 23, the hour now is for these old forms of worship to fade into the background so that the realities to which they pointed could take their place. 
The hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will be those who worship not on this mountain or on that mountain, but will be those who worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In other words, the dawn of a greater and truer form of worship was upon them, one that would utterly eclipse these old forms and these old categories of thinking about how to worship God. You follow me there? Not only for, now this is an important point, I don't have time to unpack this either, but not only for Gerizim, you've got to understand, Jesus says this about Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem too. That has ramifications for how you understand the relationship of the temple and the physical city of Jerusalem to the new covenant in the worship of God. I'll leave that. If you want to talk more about it, I'll talk later. But in the new covenant age that Jesus was ushering in, the old form of worship is fulfilled in Christ. That old form is done and it's not coming back. This is the theme that we've been seeing in the Gospel of John so far, right? It's this theme of out with the old, in with the new. Haven't we been seeing that in John chapter 2? What happens at this wedding in Cana? Jesus performs a sign of changing water into wine, and that's signifying for us the arrival of the Messiah, right? In, in an allegorical fashion, the, the wine of the old covenant had run out. The Jews had no more wine of God's grace in that covenant. It was time for the new covenant to be introduced. It was time for Jesus to come and to provide better and greater amounts of new covenant wine for God's people. That's what that sign was signifying. We saw that in John 2. And then at the end of John 2, what else do we find? That new wine involved the establishment of a new temple. Where it was no longer about the old temple. It wasn't just about cleaning up and revamping and, 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 and restoring worship at the old temple. Jesus says the day's coming when you're going to destroy this temple and I'm going to raise it up in three days. And what does John 2 say that Jesus is talking about? He's not talking about the physical temple of Herod. He's talking about the temple of his body. And in that statement, he's saying, I'm here not only to renew what's happening here. I'm not only here to cleanse what's happening here in Jerusalem. I'm here to establish an utterly new temple for, people, for God's people to worship in. And then in John chapter 3, that theme of out with the old, in with the new continues on. What happened with, um, with Nicodemus? Jesus says to him that along with the new temple that he's establishing, that new wine of the new covenant also involved the establishment of a new covenant people. Where the people of God were no longer defined or designated by physical birth, such as the people of Israel, but the true people of God were now defined by the new spiritual birth that would be worked in them by the Holy Spirit. A birth from God that knows no distinctions of ethnicity, a socioeconomic status or, 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 or reputation or popularity. A new birth that comes about from the power of the Spirit of God, bringing the truth of Christ to bear upon your heart and making you new. That's the standard of the new covenant community that Jesus came to establish. Not ethnicity. Upon the basis of the Spirit of God. Those are the only ones, Jesus says in John 3, those are the only ones who actually belong to the kingdom of God. Those who have the kingdom of God birthed within them by the Spirit. And then now in John 4, Jesus continues unpacking what is involved in ushering in the age of God's new covenant wine. Not only a new spiritual temple, not only a new spiritual people, but also the glory of a new spiritual worship that will be offered in praise to the Lord. Now we see in this pattern, we see in this a pattern that Jesus is setting forth for us for understanding the great work that he came to do as God's Messiah. That he came to fulfill all the types and shadows of old covenant worship because they were merely pointing to something greater, something that would be fulfilled in him. Now this woman was merely focused on outward forms of worship and what impact did that have practically on her daily life? Not much. Because she was still living in adultery. She was still suffering from ruined relationships. She was still cowering away, shrinking away in shame. 
over what she had done and how she had lived her life. Her external form of religion had no help, gave no, no offer of peace or hope to her. Jesus came to address the root of the problem. The real problem, woman, is that you are not truly worshiping God. Now, just as a side note of application here, sadly enough, many people today are perfectly content with external ritualistic forms of worship and never actually think through whether their heart is being engaged in worship of the Lord. For the sake of getting to what I have left to cover, I don't have time to unpack this very much, but practically, when we were just singing those songs of worship, unto the Lord, just honestly with yourself and before the Lord, how engaged was your heart in that activity? Was that an expression of soul worship? Where your heart's being gripped by truth, your mind is being, being flooded with the truth and your heart is being gripped by that truth and it's springing forth in this expression of praise and worship unto God, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. When you sang those words, did you have in your mind Examples and illustrations from your own life where God's grace had triumphed on your behalf. And you're coming before Him and you're saying, Lord, one tongue is not enough to worship You for what You've done in me. Oh, for a thousand tongues so that I could clearly and loudly declare the glories of my God and my King and what my Savior's done in my own heart. Was that you? Was that me? Or are we content with the external form and the ritual? If that's us, Jesus tells us here that God does not accept that as worship. Isn't that cutting? That ought to be cutting. What about your personal worship unto the Lord offered daily when you come before God in his word and you bow your knees to him in prayer? How often are those just the rituals and the forms, the tasks that we go through with no real heart and soul engagement before the Lord? You know, no matter, I mean, I'm not, I'm not telling you not to do that. (laughs) I'm not telling you to cast it all off until you feel like worshiping the Lord in your daily devotions. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that in the midst of those activities, you need to recognize something. That if the Holy Spirit is not inflaming your heart and you are not engaging truly from the depths of your being in worship to God through that activity, then that activity is not accomplishing anything in you. It's 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 not an expression of true worship that you can offer unto the Lord. God tells us over and over and over again in His Word, give me your heart. I don't want your sacrifices. God desires truth, not just in the mind, but in the inner being, David said. It wasn't about sacrifices and rituals and worship. David says, if I could do that, if that's what you accepted, I would do it. But that's not what you want. You want a broken and you want a contrite spirit before you. You want a heart that's truly hoping in you. You want me to come before you as one whose heart is gripped by the truth. Truth in the inner being. Psalm 51 is what I'm referring to. Anything anything short of that full engagement of our whole being and our worship to God is not acceptable worship. Remember what God said? What's the first and greatest commandment? That you would love the Lord your God? How? Just in your actions? No, not just in your actions, right? Amen? Amen? Not just in your actions, but that you would love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. I love the Hebrew on that last phrase. It really is getting at with the totality of your being, with everything you have to offer, you are to love God with that. That's true worship. If you're like me, you fall short of that. That's the, that's the glory of God to which we have fallen short in Adam. But guys, that's the glory of God that Jesus is bringing us to. 
right? And so the question, are, are, we, are we growing? Is, is that sense of true, spirit-filled, heartfelt worship, engagement of our whole being in worshiping God, I'm not asking, is that perfectly manifest in you right now? But is there a, is there, is there a sense in which that is the growing and ever-increasing reality of your life? We all go through times of, 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 of struggle. We all go through times where we've stumbled and fallen in the street. But the righteous man gets up even on the seventh fall, right? Is there, is there a sense in which your heart is being increasingly gripped by the truth of God? And your life is being increasingly offered in greater and greater expressions in worship of God in light of the truth. That's longer on that application than I intended. But we can't, Jesus is clearly teaching us here, we can't be satisfied with mere external forms. So don't, don't sell yourself short of the life of God that God's called you to live. Pursue deeper life with the Spirit. And I'm not talking about some crazy lunacy, deeper life stuff of generations past. I'm just talking about a, a, a life that is more deeply gripped by the power of God in your inner being. Ephesians 3 type life. Pursue that. Christ has purchased that for you. He's promised it to us. Let's go take it. All right. So that's, that's point number one that we see here in this text. Point number two, <clears throat> that, that, that true worship is not about external forms. Point number two. Notice how Jesus describes that new covenant worship that he's going to usher in in this age of the new covenant in verses 23 and 24. True worship is not about external forms, according to Jesus. Rather, true worship is about internal realities. He defines these internal realities of true worship in two different ways. And today we're only going to focus on one of those ways. We're going to come back to the second one next week. <clears throat> but first of all, Jesus says in both verses 23 and 24 that true worship is defined as worship in truth. True worship is worship in truth. True worshipers must worship the Father in truth. This could be understood in two different ways. And biblically speaking, either of these ways would be right, as far as the testimony of the whole Bible. First of all, we could understand by this statement that we are to worship God in truth. We could understand Jesus as speaking of worshiping the Father in sincerity, that we are worshiping him with genuineness. We are worshiping him with a true heart and a pure desire and a steadfast devotion, right? That we're not double-minded. We don't have divided hearts. We're not praying to God with our lips or praising him with our lips, but in our hearts holding on to some sin, some pet secret thing that we're still not ready to give up. No, we're worshiping God with a sincere heart of worship. We're coming before him and we're saying, Lord, you own all of me. Search me and know me and test me and see if there's anything unworthy in me. That Psalm 139 type worship. It could be that Jesus is talking about that kind of worship whenever he's talking about worshiping the Father in truth. He's worshiping the Father in sincerity. First, First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.5. You guys are here for that one. Worship that, that, is, that is out of a, a love, right? A love that grows out of a, a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere or unhypocritical faith. It could be that that's what Jesus is talking about, but I don't think that's what he means. The second option is to understand that Jesus, what Jesus is saying here is that you and I can only be true worshipers of God if we are worshiping him according to what is true about him. We can only be true worshipers of God if we are worshiping him according to what is true about him. I think that's what Jesus means here. Right? Because this, is, this was the issue at the, at, at the heart of this woman's question about where God was to be worshiped. Her false worship before God was driven by a, a misunderstanding of what was true. She wasn't worshiping God in knowledge about what was true. She was worshiping God without knowledge. It was ignorance about the truth God had revealed that led to her false worship. 
Well, I think that's what Jesus is addressing here. That in order to truly worship God, our thoughts and our understanding about him must be governed and shaped and guided by the truth. In other words, right theology produces right worship. Right thinking about God produces right expressions of worship. We must worship him in truth if we are to worship him truly. It's like John Piper said, deep thinking is what produces deep feelings about God. Deep thinking, the engagement of the mind with the truth of God, that's what produces a life of deep worship unto the Lord. And the absence of true and deep thinking about God will always give birth to false worship. Period. You know, what was true under the old covenant is also true under the new covenant. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, God says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. They had rejected knowledge about the Lord, and therefore it became the source of their spiritual destruction. See, we must know the truth about God if we would worship God in truth. Romans chapter 1, verse 25, again, it says there that we either worship and serve God with our lives according to what is true about him, or we exchange that truth for something else, for a lie, and worship and serve an idol. Now, let me say this, even if that idol bears the name Jesus, if we're not worshiping Jesus and God the way God has revealed himself in the scriptures, then we are not truly worshiping God. Now, lest anyone think that Jesus is merely talking here about an intellectual or an academic understanding of the truth, throughout the rest of this gospel, Jesus is going to preach that true worship flows from experiencing the heart altering, paradigm-shifting power of the truth. That's what brings about true worship. John 8, 32, Jesus says, if you know the truth, not just the facts about it in your mind, but if you have come to a true spiritual realization of what is true, then the truth will have an effect upon you. What will that truth do? This is more to wake you up than anything. What will that truth do? It'll set you free. Jesus says there's a power that comes with truly knowing the truth. The truth enters into your soul. It floods your heart. It reshapes your mind. It causes you to see reality for what it is, not reality for what the world wants you to think it is. You are awakened to see who God actually is, to see the glory of what Jesus has done. And you are gripped by that truth. And then that truth does something to you. Jesus says it actually sets you free. Freedom. And you know the kind of freedom he's talking about. He's talking about freedom that liberates us from our devotion to sin and darkness. A freedom that sanctifies our hearts and minds so that we can devote our lives as living expressions of worship to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the truth does. So our knowledge of the truth must lead to a worship that flows out of a deep, heartfelt attachment to that truth. Otherwise, we still don't yet know the truth. This is how Jesus even defines eternal life. John 17, 3, this is eternal life. It's knowing God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. That is, coming to a solid conviction of the truth about who God is as he has revealed himself in his word through his son, his final and full self-disclosure. So until you come to know God experientially and relationally by means of the truth, you have not yet come to savingly know him. As we come to a close, let me throw this your way. <clears throat> You know, the only way that you and I are going to gain that kind of heart-gripping knowledge of the truth is if we devote ourselves to mining it out of the treasury of God's Word. We were talking this morning in Sunday school about 
the, the, the epitome of, of the Christian life. It's being a Christian is really about manifesting the reality of God's image through our lives and, and his virtues, living that out in expressive ways before others. At least that was part of what we talked about. Um, you know, in order to do that, you actually have to know who God is and what he expects from you. Uh, some catechism questions. My, my children and I, we off and on are trying to memorize a few catechisms. And uh, I was reminded of some of the questions that we've memorized in the past. I don't know if I want to put them on the spot. But no. <clears throat> well, let's try it. Let's try it. Hey, Ruthie. Who made you? Ruthie, who made you? God made me. That's right. God made you. What else did God make? Everybody's watching. <laughs> Addie, what else did God make? God made all things. Why did God make you in all things, Josie? For his own glory. How can you glorify God? By loving him and keeping his commandments, right? That's our little rhyme. By loving him and keeping his commandments. How can you glorify God? Loving. Let me ask you this question. Where do you learn how to love and obey God? In the Bible alone. See, my kids get it. This is great. Where do you learn how to love and obey God? If God made you, he made you for a purpose. What was that purpose? That you would obey him and glorify him. That you would, um, um, what is it? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. There's a purpose behind God making you. And that purpose is so that you would exist for his glory. Now, how are you going to find out how to live for his glory? In the Bible alone. In the Bible alone. You know, the only means by which you and I will come to the point where we are worshiping God in truth is if we are devoting all of ourselves to seeking and understanding the truth revealed in God's word. As we strive to offer to God a sacrifice of worship with our lives, we must be above and beyond anything else. People of the book, right? People of my camp used to be known as people of the book. You want to you do something? You want to say something about God? You want to teach me some truth? That's fine, but you better book, chapter, verse it, right? Give me, give me the book. Give me the chapter. Give me the verse. Show me in the Word of God where that's written. We must be people like that. We must be people who read the Word of God, who memorize the Word of God, who pray the Word of God, who meditate upon the Word of God, and those who speak the Word of God, both to each other and to the people outside of this room. That's going to be costly. But that is the only sufficient and certain and infallible rule of all saving knowledge and faith and obedience is the Word of God. You know, I love quoting Spurgeon. <clears throat> I love some of Spurgeon's quotes anyway because I can say them to you and rather than you being mad at me, you can be mad at him. <laughs> you know, you're not going to have a very deep well of truth to draw from if you're never reading and studying and devoting yourself to gaining a better understanding of the scriptures. It's just that simple. Some of you actually do go the whole week without reading your Bible. That's shameful, and you should be embarrassed by that. More important than that, though, more important than shameful, there's redemption, there's grace, pick yourself up, let's move forward. But more than that, you're not growing in your appreciation of understanding God. Doesn't that bother you? Have you ever noticed a correlation between being outside of the Word of God and feeling disconnected from God? That's because the Word of God is the touch point for all of our spiritual lives. You've got to come there, and that's where God says, I'll meet you. <laughs> you come to his word. You bow to his word. You submit to his word. You bend your mind and your heart. You reshape it and reframe it to fit in with God's word. And God says, I'll bless you. All right, now here's a Spurgeon quote. Spurgeon said to his congregation, so this is flowing out of a pastor's heart. Some of you have enough dust on your Bibles to write the word condemnation. Some of you have heard that before. But that's so true. 
Is dust collecting on your Bible? You know, the depth and acceptability of our worship is determined by how deeply we grasp and how fully we are gripped by the truth of God's word. Just listen to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 to 3. Grace, Peter writes, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the full knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through what? Through a full knowledge or a true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. The knowledge of God, having a true knowledge of God, is the means God has appointed to enable us to live a life of godliness to him. Everything, all of his power is devoted towards us. And in living, Peter says that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Where is that power going to be found? Peter says, in the full, the true knowledge of the one who called you. The more you know him, in other words, the more greatly you're going to know his power in your life to live for him. That's the point. You know, no matter what you're facing, no matter what trial, what circumstance, what difficulty, what temptation, no matter what it is, your need in that moment is a greater understanding and knowledge of God's glory and excellence. You need to see how glorious God is when you're feeling tempted by sin, because that's what's going to keep you safe from that temptation. You need to see how much worthier Jesus is than anything else. You need to see... That Jesus in his majesty and splendor is worth you dying to yourself and living for the good of someone else. How are you going to live with your spouse in a way that God commands you apart from a clear vision of God in Christ? How are you going to love one another in this church body well whenever we rub each other in the wrong way? You know, you know what happens as well as I do. I rub you the wrong way. You rub me the wrong way. We rub each other the wrong way. It just happens. It's part of being sinners to gather together in one group of people, one body of people. How are we going to live with each other in love and grace and compassion and putting on a tender heart of mercy towards one another? How are we going to do that? The only thing that's going to empower us to do that is getting a greater vision of the glory and splendor and majesty of Jesus Christ. Where are you going to find that? In the Bible. The Spirit of God's going to illumine you to that reality through His, through his Word. Now, as we, as we come to an end, I'm sorry, listen to these words from R.C. Sproul. They were too good to leave out. <clears throat> this is on the importance of Scripture. R.C. Sproul says, A renewed mind results from diligently pursuing the knowledge of God. If we despise doctrine, if we despise knowledge, that probably indicates that we're still in that fallen condition where we do not want God in our thinking. Isn't that cutting? That's convicting. That's good. True Christians, R.C. Sproul writes, true Christians want God to dominate their thinking and to fill their minds with ideas of himself. That's a true Christian. I don't want to put God out of my mind. I want God to dominate my mind. I want greater thoughts of him being planted in my mind. That's what it means to worship God in truth, right? He goes on to say, nothing can be in the heart that is not first in the mind because we cannot love what we do not know. A mindless Christianity is no Christianity at all. The more we love God with our mind, He writes, the more driven we will be to worship him. True knowledge of God always bears fruit in greater love for God and greater desire to praise him. The more we know him, the more glorious he will appear to us. And the more glorious he appears to us, the more inclined we will be to praise him and to honor him, to worship him and obey him. Some good words, good statements there. Beloved, we are called to love God with all of our minds, right? That's what it means to worship God in truth, to love him with our minds and to know him truly. We cannot truly worship God apart from that, so let's press on. And let's determine that moving forward, we're going to take active steps and cultivate, create plans to pursue a greater worship of God with our minds. We cannot worship him acceptably without that. So here's the final charge, okay? If we have to love God with our minds, if we need to worship God in truth, then we all need to be readers. 
We need to be readers of the Bible. You need to adopt a plan to systematically and regularly read through the entirety of the Scripture. Do you, anybody read my article in the Oak Bridge? Some of you. You know, I put effort into that. It's worth reading sometimes. Um, but make sure you look at that because it's, quoting coming off of that, that uh, statement from A.W. Tozer, it takes the whole Bible to make a whole Christian. You need to be regularly and systematically, meaning you need to have a program, you need to have a plan to work through the entirety of the scriptures so that you will, you will put in your mind the full categories of what God has revealed in his word. So you need to be readers of the Bible. But also, if we want to worship God in the truth and we want to have minds worshiping God with our minds, then we need to be readers of good books on theology. You struggle to understand something, you don't quite understand how some doctrine fits with another, well then rather than burying it away in the spiritual closet, get a book that was written by a godly brother or sister to help explain those things to you and go read it. All things are yours, Paul says. All things are yours. Whether, whether Peter or whether Cephas or Paul or Apollos or Christ, all things belong to you. That includes the entire history of the Christian church. Everything that God has produced through the lives of his people in the past, everything that's good and worthy of, of, a, of acceptance and excellence, all of that belongs to you as a Christian. So go take it up and read it. Example. You want a better understanding of the cross and what it means that Jesus saved you through his blood? Then go read In My Place Condemned He Stood. A work of multiple authors about the glory of Christ's atonement on the cross. Or, or go read uh, Curdeus Homo, uh, Why the God-Man. Was that Ansem? Yeah. Who said that? Brownie points. Yeah, brother. You want to understand the, the, the fullness of, of the Christian life and, and theology and doctrine? Then go take up Calvin's Institutes and read them. Right? Don't, don't be intimidated. Just, just take one page at a time. Read what you can. Think about it. Process it. Put it down. Eventually, you're going to work through that entire book. And you're going to be, you, you will have been better for it. You're struggling with the concept of suffering in the world and how that relates to the, good, the goodness and love of God? Then, then go take up C.S. Lewis's The Problem of Pain and, and work through that. Read it. Grapple with these difficult issues. Don't just leave them over on the side, lingering. That's not going to do any benefit to your soul. And it's not going to help you worship God in truth. Go take up R.C. Sproul's Everyone is a Theologian and go read about how to be a good theologian, a good student of the Scriptures. Go pick up Samuel Renahan's The Mystery of Christ, His Covenant and His Kingdom and understand the relationship between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. See how it's all fulfilled in Jesus. Don't just take my word for it. Go discover it for yourselves. If you're struggling to discern whether the Holy Spirit truly is working in your life and you don't really know how to judge whether He's present, then go read Jonathan Edwards' sermons on the Holy Spirit. For example, go read the distinguishing marks of the work of the Spirit of God and you will come away with an understanding of what it means for the Holy Spirit to be working in a person's life. You're understanding how to practically live out the Christian life and endure to the end for the glory of Christ? Then go take up John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress and read the theology of the Christian life expressed in an experiential, practical, allegorical form. Go read about Christian Pilgrim. Go read about how he endures in the, in the walk of Christianity and apply that to your life. Go read bio biographies of saints who have struggled through the challenges of living a life of worship with God before, uh, who have gone before you. Go, go, read, uh, go read these brothers and sisters who have wrestled with very deep things and challenges with God. And like Jacob, they wrestling with him came away prevailing. Right? So, so for example, go read Eusebius's The History of the Christian Church. Go read Fox's Book of Martyrs and see how those martyrs faithfully endured to the end, sometimes from horrific, horrific expressions of persecution. Go read John Piper's The Swans Are Not Silent series. That's a really good series. Go read John Bunyan's Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. Go read Gladys Awald's The Little Woman. Go read T Corey Tim Boone's The Hiding Place. Go read The Diary of David Brainerd. Go read biographies of, of godly men and women who have gone before you who will help you worship God as you live your life for His glory. In other words, don't be intimidated and don't be afraid to use the mind that God has given you. He's given it to you for that reason. 
We live in an age that seems to glorify ignorance and stupidity. Laziness and slothfulness in our thinking. Don't be like that. Don't give in to the world system. That's, that's the devil's scheme to keep you from thinking more deeply about God. You know, don't give me theology, give me Jesus. Well, that's the most ridiculous statement that anyone has ever said. What Jesus are you talking about? The moment you start answering that, you're doing theology. God gave you a brain, so let's use it. Jesus says we are to worship God in truth. That means we've got to engage our minds. And so we need to seek to use this talent of our mind as a tool for loving and serving and worshiping God. God has given it to you as a means of worshiping him, so use it, beloved. Use it. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your grace. And I... I thank you that you are faithful to use your word in the lives of your people according to your grace. Father, I'm pleased to be an instrument. And I pray that I would be a good one in your hand. Father, that by your grace, your people would grow up in uh, the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we want to love you. We want to worship you well. We want to worship you with our minds. So please help us worship you in truth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.